the objects that you're drawing, we have to discern how light, how dark they are. So we use something called a value scale. Now I'm going to cut these apart for you. But I want you to fold the value scale back or cut it if you have if you have scissors, okay? So that the edge of this is clean. Okay, you're going to get it. It's going to have all the white next to it. It's not going to function. So you can either, and it's this edge we're interested in. Okay, so you can either fold it or cut it. So I would like to borrow somebody's cup of water, please. Uh, don't go get them laminated. You need the you need the raw paper surface will work best for you. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move towards an even more realistic representation of what you're looking at. We want to begin to define an object with volume. Okay. So we're going to use the techniques we've been doing, okay? We're going to draw the same way with the brushes and the sticks. And if you've got a bamboo pen, I'm going to be drawing the same way. But I'm going to show you how to apply value, okay? And the grayscale that I just gave you is for the second half of the class. We're going to uh, do some drawings the first half of the class just to get used to the materials. Okay, And we'll set some subject matter up. It'll be a little bit different than what you've been drawing. Okay, And uh, so here is, here is my grayscale that I use. And I'll show you how to do that the second half of the class. Okay, But from now on through the rest of the semester, okay, now you've got a viewfinder, right? You've got the larger viewfinders up here still. If you want to use these, okay, you can put them right on the subject matter. That helps. We've got a grid, okay. We've got a grid scale, okay. So you need all those tools every class, and you need all those tools for your out-of-class drawing. So you may decide you want to use a gridded piece of paper as well as your see-through transparent grid for your out-of-class drawings. You may want to draw them in pencil first and then you may want to use whatever the media of choice is for that assignment. Okay, so we're going to begin to discern the value of what we're looking at and what value will help define is three-dimensional uh, form, roundness, the fact that it isn't flat. Because there are three basic simple values to everything that we see. Lightness, mid-tones, and darkness. Okay, So we put the heavier dark values at the bottom of the value scale, and we gradually change to mid-tones, and then we gradually change to lighter values. This is also referred to as high-key, low-key, okay. This indicates that that area is receiving light. And as you gradually change subtle steps from light to dark, this indicates that area receives less light and a gradual change in between. The more abrupt the change, the flatter your space, the flatter your object. The more gradual a change, subtle steps, more steps from light to dark. 
the more illusion of dimension. Okay? That's an important formula. But the first half of the class is going to be this. With your brushes and your sticks. You're going to try a couple of different techniques. Okay, and the string we haven't done before. I saw something on the internet I thought we would try. It looked pretty cool. So I thought we'd try this. So you're gonna work you're gonna work on dry paper and you're gonna work on wet paper. Okay. So right now we have an incredible variety of effects we can create just by that and an incredible variety of values. If we're just using clear water, and you've got a wet surface, I can do something called spot wetting. I'm not gonna wet the whole surface of the paper. However, with some of those big, large brushes you have, you can. So I want you to try all those ideas. We're gonna be doing a lot of drawings today, so you may wanna try one drawing where you're doing the whole paper is wet, okay? So we've got these beautiful bleeding effects. And on the iPad, we have tools that show that the bleed will continue to flow if you've got an angle, yes, until you actually click touch the fan. They have a little fan tool. So you can just allow everything to continue to bleed or you can stop its flow by hitting the fan. So you guys don't have anything like that. So you're going to be having lots of liquid and it'll take as much time in real time for it to dry. You can work on a dry piece of paper and add liquid to it. Hmm? Okay, so ink will dry and be a permanent. That was still a little damp. And then you can pour into it with water or touch it with water in your brush and it will continue to bleed some more. Okay. Different effects and when it dries it will look and it will take a while for it to dry but if you have an area that is really starting to dry and you drop and introduce more water into it it will create an interesting flourish along the edge. Um, you'll hear them called various things, backwashes, water spots. And at, again, as with our stick drawings where the tendency is to keep working on it and working on it and working on it, you, you want to maintain a fresh, good-looking quality to your lines, to your marks. So again, these are about mark making. A gesture drawing. Here, this is going to be about not only the marks, but and these are also marks that painted the brush marks, the brush strokes, the beauty of how you use that tool. Okay. So who has got a wide brush that they would let me use? And you want to get all of your brushes out today, okay? So watch this. You're going to have a couple of different values. So I can also drop water into this. Thank you. And I can also, that's it. And I can also drop ink into it. You're going to have a couple of different values, right? Okay. 
here's what we want. I want you to spend just maybe five minutes exploring your tool away from that pencil clench. It's because these are, again, shoulder, okay, not wrist drawings. got lots of great examples to show you of these. These are called ink wash drawings. Okay. And you may draw these exactly the same way we have been working. Left hand, right hand, blind, left hand, blind, right hand. Okay. Half sided, half blind. Start one sided, finish it blind. Okay, you can manage that. Okay. It's not a good idea to let your brushes sit in the liquid. Uh, believe me, uh, it will damage your brushes very quickly. These are not uh, expensive brushes, so they will uh, lose their ferrules and hair pretty quickly if you sticks. It doesn't matter. Okay. This is called a hake, H-A-K-E. This is little rabbits on the edge. Uh, this is uh, called a mop brush. It holds also a lot of liquid, lots and lots of liquid, so that you can really work with this for quite a while before you run into that starting to become a dry brush when it runs out of liquid. Okay. As long as you don't let this dry, you just need clean water to rinse it out, squeeze out the water, let it dry like that, and it's good to go for the next time. These fan brushes are, again, you can drag these around sideways or splatter yes. and the same with a hockey brush and what do you do with your I'm gonna let you do it but I'm gonna act as if <laughs> all right you can hold these and shut them the wrong way you could go sideways with these I even did a did a painting one time where you it I twisted it in the middle you could do that with your water first and then touch it with the ink and watch it move across the uh, page. Okay, so we're just going to let this dry the rest of class and you can see some of the effects that might happen just with wet. This is called wet in wet and wet on dry wet liquid on dry vapor, okay, which can then become wet and wet. If you want to draw with your fingers, no reason why not. Right. Okay, so you are going to mix up the three pigments, and we're going to do this next class also. So if you didn't bring your cups today, not a big disaster, okay? But we want to end up with five cups. If today you just have clear water, black ink, and a medium value, that's good to go. Okay. If you have five cups, you're going to have ink, water, a light value, a medium value, and a dark value. Now, this value scale steps black one and two Black and one appear to be almost the same thing. So when you try out your values on your paper to get an even kind of distribution, you want to make sure it's not an abrupt change from medium to black. Okay. Don't spend too long doing this. I'm going to set out some subject matter for you, and then we'll start to uh, uh, look at the subject and make the drawings, okay? 
And so play around with this for a little bit. At 3 o'clock, I'll stop you. I'll show you the examples. Okay. And I'll have the subject matter set up for you. And you can begin to draw the objects. Questions? So the, why are we using the lights? Anybody know? Yeah, it's great shadows. Okay, you don't want this to be awkward, so you want your stuff right near you so that you don't have to be slow about making these drawings. You don't want to go at lightning speed either, but you want it to flow. You don't want big awkward pauses. You want to just react directly and intuitively to what you see. The uh, Heights. Okay, the thrust of these drawings now. And if you need your viewfinder, get your viewfinder. The thrust of these drawings are number one, what? Okay, your looseness. What does that what does that describe? Your looseness describes the motion which makes the the gesture, the mark. Okay, it's the quality of your marks. Okay, there is an intrinsic beauty in the way a pigment and a tool lay on a piece of paper, a piece of drawing paper. Okay. That's what we're looking for. And what else? What else? Mm -hmm. Quality of mark. What else? Recognizability. Thank you. Recognizability, there's still beautiful marks. Gesture, what is the consequence of good gesture drawing? What were you all doing when you were movement? Okay. Quality of mark. Movement. What was the third thing? Recognizability. Okay. In the real world, we would call this abstraction. That's kind of a scary word. <laughs> so we're just going to call it gesture. Keep the marks fresh. So I want you to look at your drawings while you're making them initially. And I want you to contrive beautiful marks that are describing your objects. This is what I want to do. Okay, I've got some examples to show you. So I'm gonna let you draw until four o'clock in this fashion. Just three simple values. Make a full composition. You are doing an object within a context. Another way of speaking about this is figure slash ground. Okay? You are never just drawing an object floating in the middle of a void. I'd say that the, is the biggest collective undergraduate art major issue. You can think of a thing to draw, but you can't think of a context, an aesthetic, artistic composition, the whole rectangle. Okay. We had an artist um, last fall do an exhibition of assemblage, and she cleared out our, our thank goodness.
goodness she cleared out our uh, prop room. We had a gar skeleton. Anybody know what a gar is? Anybody get out to the lake? Yeah. So. Now there's some extra drawing tool used in that drawing and this drawing. Is anybody noticing what that is? White chalk. Okay. On top of dense, dark material. It's a nice white line. But you do that when it's dry. Here's a portrait. I think for your out-of-class assignment, I may give you the option of doing a self-portrait by looking in the mirror. This was uh, somebody in class. Okay, so birds with a little more pizzazz. Another self-portrait. I was looking for my vacuum. This was my first vacuum cleaner that I bought at resale for $35. It's very funky. Royal. It's not in the room anymore. It disappeared. A beautiful flower shape. These are friends, the birds. Do you see how beautifully exploitative? Look at this. That's stunning. Beautiful marks. Can you tell what the subject matter was? Yeah, yeah they're sitting up there. Okay. What is it called when we don't draw the object, but we call the space? What is that called? Negative space. Negative space. Beautiful. Try some negative space drawings. Scale. if it were a body of water. Okay. 
first thing I'm going to show you is our examples. Okay, so we're going to use paper bags as our subject. Uh, we're going to let the origami up there, and we're going to let the fruit up there. Everything else we're going to uh, uh, remove uh, most of that so that at this point we're gradually working our way back to a more and more descriptive, specific type of rendering. Remember how we started out the semester with the contour, okay? So we're going to notice subtle changes in value, changes from lightness to darkness, okay? And I'm going to show you before we're done today uh, with my demonstration how you discern lightness and darkness with this value scale. I didn't show you how to use that last class. Okay. Uh, then we're going to uh, talk about your ink wash process. Okay. So first let me show you examples of ink wash that describes that something has three dimension and volume which is the opposite of flat okay so the more tools we have available to us now we have value okay the more tools we have available to us the more ability we have to create that illusion or that sense or the visual appearance of volume of mass of weight. What really is significant in creating weight of an object? The darkness? The darkness? Yes. Any particular part of the subject? That shadow. shadow. Exactly. So if you have an object to keep it from floating in the middle of the ether, for the void, you must give it weight and volume. And part of that is, yes, you show that it has light. And if it's got dimension, there are parts of that object that don't receive what light. So they're going to be darker. Okay, That's just the nature of appearance. So you will have light, you will have midtones, and you will have dark. And part of the dark that creates the grounding is the shadows, okay? And the shadows underneath an object, there isn't just one value to that shadow. I want you to look closely. And again, you can scooch up closer to that subject matter if you want to, but you're going to see double, triple, quadruple shadows where the shadows are coming from different directions because there's multiple light sources up there coming from multiple different directions. We've got them coming from all four directions up there. So you're going to have maybe up to four shadows overlapping. And that just becomes delicious stuff to draw. Beautiful stuff. And I want you to see Shadows aren't black, are they? No, they're not. They're just a little bit darker than the surface the shadow's being cast on. Okay? So that's why you have the ability now to do this range of white of the paper, black of the ink, and you have a range of grays in between. The gray that you mix up is going to be a different value on dry paper than it is on wet paper. So there you've got you've got five values. Whether it's on dry or wet gives you five extra values. Okay. So you, have, you don't have to mix up ten cups <laughs> of fluid. You only have to mix up three. Okay. So that the values that you have three cups for of course, you've got clear water, paper white, you've got solid ink, and then you have those three transitional values that are gradual change in between, okay? 
So this is a 10-step value scale that I gave you. Okay. So high key means light. Low key means dark. Good. Okay. So we have this example. And this is a lot to draw. Uh, it, it, it's uh, not going to allow you to see subtleties and specifics and to render them as effectively as a larger scale rendering. But remember, this starts to teeter on the edge of what is it. Here, we can tell that these are paper bags. We can tell what the subject is. Okay. And we want to be able to discern what the subject is. This and this both do something very effectively. So take a look at these carefully. And we're talking about atmospheric perspective in our landscape metaphors. So if we want to enhance that sense of space from what does an object look like when it's closer to us what does the object look like in the middle of the landscape? And what does the object look like when it's further in the distance? Do these render things a little bit differently in the foreground than they do in the background? How so? Like from far away, kind of see things blurry and less detail. Less detail in the distance. OK. What else? It's lighter, okay, especially here. Okay, things in the distance are the lowest contrast. So if you have a white sky or a light sky, things in the distance will be closer to it on the value scale. So light grays. If we had a black sky, what would the objects in the distance be? Dark gray, yes, medium gray. The lowest contrast. So when I say low contrast, I mean very little difference in values. So anything close to each other on the value scale is low contrast. The highest contrast, which is in the foreground, would be what values? Black and white, that's the highest contrast you could have. It could be darkest gray and lightest gray. That's still high contrast. Okay. But you would not find that in the background. Foreground high contrast. Middle ground, what kind of contrast do you think? Mid yes, medium contrast. So that would be maybe three step gray and seven step gray. A light gray and a dark gray. Not as high contrast as black and white. And then in the background, it might be two values directly next to each other on the value scale. Okay, So it's high contrast to medium contrast in the middle ground to low contrast in the background. OK? OK, an example of trying to render something uh, volumetric with a mass and with a weight. And you can tell, we want to be able to tell that that's a reflection okay, in a metaphorical body of water. Or if you stand it upright, it would be a metaphorical building, building. building with windows. All right, so here are some of the, now I, I have these students using different subject matter than you, but, and again, do you see the presentation? The presentation makes it complete, okay? So everything you turn in from now through the rest of the semester will be presentation complete, okay? So for this next out of class, you're gonna turn in another Mount. Okay? So what are we looking at here? Models. Models. You 
can tell what it is, look at the scale, and you see the different values to show. There's also transparency here, too. That's nice. Okay, but we can tell what it is. Look at how it fills up the entire picture plane. So a much better composition here on your left than on the right. On the right, we have things just kind of pooled in the center of the paper. Okay. Now, if you want to do a horizontal composition, uh, if you have to trim your drawing down a little bit, if you have to trim a little off the bottom, uh, somebody told me that the uh, uh, board isn't big enough to mount a horizontal. Uh, it is if you trim your drawing down a little bit. So if you have to trim it down to get the two inches down here horizontally, then that's what you'll have to do. Okay. You'll probably, the rest of the semester, especially when we do our maths, you'll have to trim your drawings down to be able to get things to fit together. Okay. Do we so, just trim one dimension? You know, whatever needs to be trimmed. Just brushes. So we call that a painterliness, and this paper that you're using is exploiting the medium beautifully, okay? If you let it, and some of you are really forcing those brush strokes on there. Remember, I suggested everybody use more fluid. Allow the paper and the pigment, the liquid pigment, to interact naturally. Allow them to do what they're meant to do and let it alone. Don't force it with your brush strokes so much, okay? So look at this, this beautiful integrity of media effects. Really pretty. Uh, up here, not so much, okay? Up here, a little too forced with the brush strokes. But this does not keep it from being representational and recognizable, okay? So allow that fluidity to carry through. Okay, here's uh, kind of what we've been doing again. Uh, 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 this, this is a much better rendering in through here, but if you've got rid of the thin strokes and allowed more fluid to sit, we would have more beautiful marks on the paper. So try not to force Remember, we're not painting a wall, which when we paint a wall, we just go up and down. It's not very pretty. No, we just want even uh, looking wall. But when we're painting a drawing or a painting, we want beautiful strokes, beautiful uh, <coughs> exploitation of media effects, okay? Liquid fluidity. How do I know whether it's a horizontal or vertical? How do I know whether it's right side up or upside down? Two inches. I'm looking for the two inches, yes. Okay. So, you know, we have a tiny little bit of, of line work in this, but it's not a consistent value. So my guess is that's the value of the edge as it changed. Okay, but you want the value of the object, of the side of the object as it changes. And these blocks should provide all of that information for you. And if it doesn't do it well enough with one kind of lighting, then you change it around and you change the lighting around so that you can contrive a good three-dimensional setup for yourself. Yeah. You see how these brush strokes get in the way? It's very dominating. It's in the center. It's a circle. Uh, it's very distracting. Okay. Um, and here the lines really do get in the way. But take a look at this. When the lines go away, look at this beauty. Look at that. It, look how the lines flatten this one out and when you take away the lines and you just have beautiful edges and beautiful washes how it becomes more of an illusion 
of the objects. It's going to start to look more and more and more real. This is the really fun part. Okay. This gets pretty exciting at this point. Okay. Draw large. You, know, you don't want uh, objects any that's really kind of small. Okay. Really kind of small. This is a good size. These are good sizes. You can even draw larger. There's an awful lot to do. Okay. But don't go so big that we, again, can't tell what it is. Stand back away while you're doing it. Stand back away. Stand back away. And because you have to work on it flat, and you can't stand it up until it's dry, you may have to, for example, lay it on the floor and stand on top of a chair or a desk to look at it. Get on your top bunk, look at it on the floor, something like that. Okay. All right, so any questions about your outside of class? With your grayscale, and remember you're going to use, is your grayscale folded over or cut on the edge? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is how you're going to determine what value your object is that you're looking at. Of course, when you hold your grayscale and you look at your object, you're going to have to shut one eye, right? And you are going to have to squint with the other one, so to be able to tell. So Kiana's shirt, you want to move your grayscale through and be able to tell what value is because you're going to see a contrast no matter whether it's in color and I'm going to look at the back of the blackboard and I'm going to move my grayscale around to the point where I don't see any contrast or difference from one value to the other and it's this value okay you can't do this with your eyes open have to squint to where your eyes are almost shut. And as you move your grayscale over what you're looking at to see what value it is, you will see no difference in contrast between the value what you're looking at and your grayscale. It takes a little practice. You could do it not just with black and white and gray, but I'm going to make most of it easy for you today. We're only going to look at black, white, and gray stuff. Okay. And your grayscale. But you can do it with color too. All right. Let's look at Anna's shirt. Figure out what particular value that blue is. And on my grayscale, her blue is this value. That's where I see no difference between the blue and its value. It loses an edge there. It just all melts into one big value. So when that edge disappears and you see no contrast and it all looks like one big value, that's the value it is. And that's how you tell. Okay? Everybody in the world, in all of art history, has done it this way. Be able to tell what value it is. Okay? All right. And then you use that value in your drawing. Okay? So that's how grayscale works. Why do I want this? This is the reality check tool. Okay? I don't want you guessing at it. That's your left brain getting in the way. I want you to determine because your left brain will look at a gray piece of paper and they'll say, oh, great. Or they'll look, your left brain, your left brain will look at a white piece of paper and go, oh, that's white. No, it's not. It's got light grays in it and it might even have dark grays down in here depending on how much light is not getting to it. Okay, and again, we looked at that black piece of origami, right? We know it's a black piece of paper, but it's not. Okay, 
Okay. So if we were to figure out what value that particular piece part of the origami is that's receiving light, it's going to be up in here. It's going to be up in here, depending on how much light it's getting. Okay. All right. So your left brain will tell you it's black. Use the line adapter and <laughs> figure out. Let your right brain see what's there. Okay, I think that's all the demo except for this. And so now I'm going to switch over to the desktop and I want to show you what this handout is about. Okay? It's a way we gradually get to dark. So we call it working light to dark. Okay, so I'm going to get a piece of paper and I'm going to borrow somebody's board and somebody's values and I'm going to show you how you gradually work to light to dark. So that's what this handout is showing you. It's showing you, and you can use a pencil if you want to, to gesture in the composition. You work with an entire composition. Okay, you don't work on one little apple and finish that little apple from start to finish in your composition. And the rest of the paper is white. That's not how we do it. We first establish a composition, and again, you can do that with pencil, okay? Uh, if you want to do eraser, that's fine. The pencil, just draw over top of it. You don't need to erase, because you're gonna put an ink wash on top of it. If you're drawing light enough, we're not gonna see the pencil, okay? So, you can see that this example moves from first step, second step, third step, fourth step. It gradually gets dark. So you start at <coughs> high key, high key values first. You go from paper white, you let paper white, the whitest whites, stay untouched. You gradually start with your lightest wash and you can let that light wash dry. You can go over it with that light wash again on dry paper. That'll darken it a little bit and gradually at a time. You don't put black or dark onto your drawing until the final step, okay? You can always get darker in these ink wash drawings, but once it's black, it can never go back light. Okay, we're not going to take our white chalk and go over the black ink. Okay, that's going to look nasty in these drawings. We just want them to be these great gray ink washes. Okay, so let me demonstrate a little bit on how you get there. And you do it gradually. And you do it all the light value all through your drawing first. See how it's the whole drawing. And then your next darkest values. Think about what's the next darkest, and then the next darkest all the way through. And you treat the next darkest value all through your drawing until you get to the darkest values, which may not be black, okay? It may just be a dark gray or the darkest gray. Does that make sense? No? Okay. So you creep into it a little bit at a time. How many have ever done classic black and white dark room photographic development? Anyone? Just a couple of you, okay? You know how when you put the white paper in the developer, liquid developer, and you rock that developer pan, that all of that value gradually starts to merge. What do you see first? You see the lightest values in that image come up. And then the more it's left in the developer, the more values th that you see, and the more contrast that you see until finally you've got the rich, rich blacks, the crispy white whites, and all this range of value in between. And you pull it out of the developer, and you put it in the stop bath. You stop it from developing. That's what we're looking for. That's the ideal black and white image. And that's the aesthetic for drawing. That's the aesthetic for black and white photography. Okay, is the crispiest whites 
the richest blacks and a nice gradual beautiful change from light to dark in between. The more gradual your changes, the more values you have, the more an illusion of dimension, of volume, of mass, gravity, weight. The more, the fewer the values, the more abrupt the changes, the flatter the space. Okay? And that's the magic formula. Okay? And it makes sense, but it takes practice and time. <laughs>